Hey, what's up, bookworms? A very special treat today is I am joined by the man who I said has the most bomb-ass Malazan channel on YouTube, and I mean that in the highest of compliments. Please welcome uh, Mr. Iskar Jarak. Am I first off, am I saying Iskar Jarak? Am I pronouncing that right? Is that how it's said? That's how I say it. I don't know if it's right or not. Uh, well, I am so happy to have you here because, you know, I'm one book in, and I'm sure you know, I enjoyed the book quite a bit. My, uh, my uh, non-spoiler review, I actually recorded it yesterday, but it'll be out by the time this video releases. And, and I said that I was, if this is the worst book that this series has to offer, as it was kind of sold to me as, uh, I think I'm about to buckle up for something that's going to end up being very, very dear to me. So I, I figured that the best way to do this is kind of, uh, since this is the first wrap up for a book on this uh, read along that I'm doing, uh, I wanted to kind of ask you a couple questions about first, like how did you discover the series and, and why did you decide that this was the series that you wanted to create a channel based on? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I started out like late to fantasy actually, and even just fiction reading in general. So I'm like in my regular life, uh, uh, like data nerd spreadsheets and all that stuff. And I was always like of the mind that if I was going to read, I wanted to like walk away better off for it or something or like able to mm. make more money or do whatever with right. my uh and i didn't realize that like fiction is a big part of expanding your horizons and whatever so long story short like late 20s i got into uh reading fiction and people had recommended fantasy and like neil gaiman and stuff and then i read the uh, ice and fire and i wanted something that was finished so i loved the ice and fire books i like charged right through them and then i was waiting for the fifth book for a long time and then yeah, now, welcome to the club <laughs> yeah, exactly and uh and so i was like googling like what's a good like finished series and people were like oh there's this one that's like you know malaz just finished like uh you know a year ago and so i jumped into that and didn't even decide to i didn't know what i read i re charged through it and uh and then i got to the end and i was like oh my gosh what did i just read and i like immediately reread it again uh, and this was many years ago. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I had done my third reread after like letting it stew for a while. I read it twice. And then I was like, dude, there was something really there. And I went back and like read it again. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's just like, there was so much stuff even, you know, on the third time that I was like picking up and I was like, gosh, this is like, why aren't people talking about this? Mm -hmm. And there was like no content. And I saw a Daniel Green video where he talked about it a long time ago. And I was like, that's all we got was just like one little video talking about it. And I was like, you know what, forget it. I'm going to at least start some conversation. Someone will see my videos and think they could do a better job. And then lo and behold, we'll have more, you know, content. And that's kind of how it happened. Awesome. Well, uh, like I said, I, I feel like I owe your channel quite a bit because I was curious about I me. Mean, I, I, my story was that I had heard of the series around like 2005. And I also had George R.R. R. Martin complex where I was waiting mm -hmm. for his books forever so I was like, I don't want to start anymore. My excuse then was, oh, I want to wait till the series is finished. And then once it was finished, it's like, I got to find another excuse because I've heard that this is a very, very tough series. I hadn't even read Wheel of Time yet. But when I finished Wheel of Time and I found your video that says, hey, you like Wheel of Time. Yeah. I think this will be like the next logical step. And I said, OK, I'll present this idea for a read along and see if anyone wants to read with me. And I thought mm, maybe I'll get like five people. And I've got hundreds of people who have, like me, been putting it off because I would say if there is one fault I found with the, with the fandom, I do think they'd scare a lot of new readers off by telling them, oh, oh it's just incredibly, terribly hard, and you're just going to struggle with it, and you're not going to understand it at all. It Maybe on your fifth reread, you'll understand it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> wait a second. you know, This is a big series. I don't know about my fifth reread, right? So, but uh, now that I'm one book in, uh, I actually think that the, uh, the fear-mongering helped a little bit because I yeah. approached it with that attitude of, you know what? You're not going to understand everything. And I'm fine. I've committed to the whole series regardless of how I feel about it. But again, what I've told you when I talked with you and Philip is if this is the worst book that this series has to offer, I'm, I'm very, very excited about it. Yeah, no, I'm in, I'm in the same exact camp. I mean, I think it was a disadvantage at first, but, you know, not getting people to jump in. But now that it's getting kind of some momentum going and we have your channel with the read along and a lot of people are just like discovering through Philip and, and everybody else that, uh, that it's actually an asset now because they have this, you know, it's like when someone tells you a movie's really good and then you go in and you're like, yeah, it was good. But, you know, and this is like the exact opposite. You've been told that it's terrible and it's hard and you're never going to get it. And then you read it and you're like, oh my gosh, this is pretty legit. I think one of the there was a foreword in the book by Steven Erickson, the version that I'm reading, and he talks about how he considered, 
you know, changing things up a bit. And then one, the phrase that caught my eye, cause I'm a big Dune fan, big Frank Herbert devotee. I, mm-hmm. I think the man was brilliant far ahead of his time. And he said, you know, damn it, Frank Herbert didn't feel like he needed to do that. And I kind of followed his structure with Dune. So that was, for me, was like right away. I was like, okay, well, uh, maybe that this is going to be something I really enjoy. Now that I read, I could see, okay, I think this might be the most dune style of novel I've read since Dune. And that's the highest the compliments come from me because I love the Dune. It's like, you know, we're going to use all this terminology that you don't understand. You just roll with it and expect that's just the way things are now. I don't have to explain them to you because it's common knowledge in this universe. And I think that's a great, great use of uh, storytelling. Yeah, definitely. You're just riding shotgun, you know, and figuring things out along with the, uh, with the characters and that like causes anxiety. Cause it's like, you don't know everything and have all this extra knowledge and whatever, but that's what makes it fun too. Is cause you're, you know, it's a journey. I actually like being dropped in the universe and just being told, Hey, this is the way that things are. It, my, my whole thing with the, I'm probably saying it wrong. I've always said in media res, is that how you say it? Or is it like, I don't, oh, yeah. I don't. but we know what that means. It means you're just kind of dropped into the middle of a story, yeah. but uh I am okay with that as long as the author had a plan. And from what everybody tells me, he knew where he was going the whole time. So uh, I I am excited about that. But uh, let's actually talk about the book now. What I'll say, guys, um, I'm going to put a link to his channel and a link to his Discord. His Discord is very, very friendly. Uh, They are very... They understand that not everyone's read this, so they won't kill you with spoilers. That's what I appreciate because I was afraid to go into the server for a while because I was like, oh, well, they're just going to be flowing spoilers everywhere. But uh, like Wheel of Time fans, I feel like they just want to see your reaction. So they definitely don't want to spoil anything for you. So I'll drop a link to both of those guys. Definitely please check that out. But talking about the book, there will be full spoilers for just Gardens of the Moon. Uh, if you haven't finished the book yet, please do so uh, and watch this then. But uh, yeah, nothing after Gardens of the Moon because that would be very mean to me. <laughs> but let's kind of talk about the book now. What really caught me at first is like the prologue. Okay, I'm interested. Chapter one, yeah, it's pretty good. And then I got to the Siege of Pale in chapter two. And I yeah. said, holy hell, this is like the ending of a trilogy right now. I did not expect anything <laughs> that heavy right away. And I didn't even mind. It was like, Hey, this is the aftermath of the battle. Now we're going to flash to like, it basically does like that thing of an episode of alias and says, Hey, 48 hours earlier, here's what happened. And, and I actually, I actually liked that quite a bit, but yeah, yeah, that was just epic on a scale. I wasn't expecting that early in the book. Totally. No, it's a, a huge hook. It's like, you know, what you expect at the end of a book, I think is mm-hmm. just the epicness and, uh, and it, you know, the tone and just kind of the magic introduction, right. Cause you get like, the the fireball aspect of the magic like the the kind of combat part but then like right in the aftermath with hairlock and all of that you get kind of like the other you know more like kind of spookier side of the magic like the horror side and the body shifting and all that so there's just uh, a lot to love yeah i was told yeah this series isn't grim dark it's just adult i'm like yo there's a guy cut in half in the first <laughs> In like the first 50 pages of the book, I was like, that's pretty dark, guys. But uh, yeah, the the hairlock part, that was when I was like, okay, this is very, very different. I'm not expecting anything like a, a, a living marionette, but I love the idea of soul shifting. That's very, very cool. Yeah, no, and that's like a, a theme that that keeps going on throughout the book. So it's uh, it's just a cool, you know undefined it's that's what i like too is the magic's nebulous you know it's like there's all different kinds of magic and you can't really say it's hard i've tried to make them out you know a malazan magic video and it's hard because there's just so many different types you got like tool you got like quick ben there's just so many so much stuff going on all right well hell let's just get right into it warrens um uh yeah i know uh <laughs> warrens i i feel like I knew right away, I'm not going to try to understand this. I mean, it's hard when you've read a lot of Brandon Sanderson because he's so good about explaining his magic yeah. systems, you know. So we get into this, and I was like, I don't even feel like maybe the characters understand Warrens that much. So I'm not going to yeah. worry myself too much about understanding this. But yeah, the magic is like crazy right away. And uh, it, I think it's what made me really like Tattersail uh, yeah. immediately. And she's like a great introduction. You know, I think she has early on, I don't know what chapter it is, but she talks about, you know, um, using magic and how, you know, you it's kind of like a doorway and you nudge it open a crack and what leaks out is is for you to shape and mold and whatever. And I, you know, that's kind of a good way to th- think about it because I always think of the Warrens are like physical places almost or like realms or these like magical places or whatever. And so it's like you're kind of, um, somehow drawing that into to the real life, quote unquote. I think there's one thing I understood less than the Warrens. It was the deck of dragons. Now, at first mm. I was like, okay, these are just like uh, tarot cards, right? And then I started like, 
No, I think there's a lot more to it than that. And that not everyone can read like, like Tayshirin has tattered cell reading form because he can't do it. So I, it, obviously it's, I, I imagine that that's something that would be really good on a reread because it feels like trying to decide, it feels like you're trying to learn a prop, figure out a prophecy, you know, without reading, you know, 90% of the series. So I was just let it go. I let it go right away. Oh yeah. And uh, we have in the spoiler channel on the discord, like people are going through those little readings and trying to interpret all the little uh, cards that get spit out and linking it to events from later books and stuff. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. So So it's actually actually something that's still under debate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's not totally clear. You can read those cards and then go, Oh my gosh, was this like foreshadowing this thing that happens like seven books later? And it's like, I don't know, you know? And so there isn't a definitive answer, but there's like a lot of uh, like cool things to speculate on in those. Yeah. It's very, very uh, like, (laughs) I think I, when I did my, my spoiler talk, I did my second one. I said, I think I said, I don't know about 437 times. And I don't imagine that number is going to go down. One yeah, thing I no. do know is I don't think that this will ever be adapted to live action because I when I read uh, the Siege of Pale and just getting a description of Moonspawn and I was like, this would be billions of dollars to make. There's a reason this has probably never been adapted. And I know that technology keeps improving and special effects are getting cheaper and cheaper. But I was like, I don't yeah. know if this could be adapted. I mean, even in CG, right? Like it would still cost a boatload of money to have somebody um, design flying mountains and make it look realistic. Even to do it full animated would probably cost a boatload of money. I don't know. I mean, you go back 20 years and I said, hey, they'll never be able to do Lord of the Rings. And they pulled that off. But again, that just seems like it was just the perfect time for something like that. But this, I was like, I hear the word unfilmable a lot. I was like, I just don't see how this could ever be done. But I mean, hell, I'd love to see it. It would be, it sounds like it would be amazing. And I, I think Erickson's still trying. Uh, that's yeah, what I've heard. No. He's still trying. I mean, obviously, every author would love to see their work adapted. I think you have to figure out a way to do it. I don't know how, you know, I mean, uh, and I think you'll have a lot of the fans who'd be pissed if you didn't do full, like, book by book, faithful uh, adaptations. But I think you might have to consider slicing and dicing and mashing different pieces I together. I think they'd probably stuff. have to try to find a way to make the series linear if they adapted it, just because the casual viewer would not be in for this broken format that the series seems like it's going to take. That would be really- yeah. So I would I not be one to be involved with storyboarding story story right. that because storyboarding right. that sounds like it would be <laughs> a project right. in itself. But yeah, I look at something like The Expanse where you have the authors involved with doing the show and it's, it's, it's translated so well. So yeah, who knows? Love who knows? Uh, if, if Wheel of Time is successful, I think it'll actually, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it'll actually open the door for more things because if, if, if A Song of Ice and Fire didn't have a, a successful adaptation, we never would have got Witcher. We never would have got Wheel of Time. So I want these things to do well because it'll open the door. For things like this, instead of HBO saying, hey, let's do three Game of Thrones prequels, you know, we can just, uh, you know, adapt some other series. Yeah, spread the love. Come on. Uh, and Amanda Rake. Uh, mm-hmm. I think this has to be the coolest cat that I've come across in fantasy in a while. And I don't know if it's just because I got such a tiny little bite of him, but he's got the cool. I-, I love a kick ass sword. I'm a fantasy fan. Who doesn't love a kick ass sword ever since I was a kid and I read King Arthur? You know, I've loved Excalibur. I love the idea of a really badass sword, but one that yeah. like takes souls and imprisons them and stuff. And the what the the, the chains and, and the wheels. And I'm like, man, this is just really, really some deep stuff. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about Rake here for a second. The, and the Tist Andy. Uh, obviously, I want to know more. Uh, at first, I mean, when I saw the picture of him, I thought, okay, is this the villain? Because he kind of looks like a villain, right? Yeah. And I'm like, but he's like this group that's trying to protect these last two free cities. And it's kind of, so it's like, it's kind of hard not to root for them, even though I think there is no clear cut good or bad guys in this series. Yeah, definitely. And he's kind of like the sticking up for the underdog, like maybe taking them the most uh, morally good (laughs) position, arguably. And so it is, it's weird because you kind of, on the one hand, you're like, oh my gosh, I like these bridge burners and quick Ben's cool, you know, and I like whiskey Jack and stuff. You're like, but then they're like, um, you know, taking over, conquering all these, you know, cities and countries and whatever. And so, um, but he's cool because he also just has like the the kind of weight of, of a character too, because he has, you know, all, all the folks in the sword and whatnot, but also he's got like his whole uh, clan or his whole entire race of people that he's basically like leading into all this stuff. And so he's just like a really weighty character too. And like, everybody's like, you see him mostly through, or I guess totally through everyone else's eyes. And they're just like, everyone else is like, Oh my God, this dude rakes. So it's just, it sets a crazy tone. And then the only times you actually see interactions with him, he delivers on that. He's like killing gnarly dogs and doing gnarly magic fireballs and stuff. Uh, I think, Oh my God. I I feel like I'm forgetting the character's name. 
uh, the guy that's kind of the the high mage that's in a that's in Darugistan that's talking with. Oh yeah, the high alchemist Baruch. Baruch, Baruch. I want to say Bynum. Baruch. Uh, I like what I liked about Rake is he's not like a tyrant. You know, he's obviously more yeah. powerful than everyone else. But when Baruch actually like stands up to him, he like likes that. He respects that because no one's talked to him like that in a long time. Uh, that was that was a layer that I really appreciated with him. Yeah, no, he's he's cool because he like uh, actually is, you know, you have like the kind of and that's a cool theme in the books, too, is like you have the kind of legendary aspect of all these people. Right. Like the bridge burners. And then and then you have like the reality of those people. And so you're kind of constantly confronting like the, you know, this big reputation. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, this guy's like kind of kind of a cool dude. He just wants someone to like have beers with and like treat him like an equal. But he also like doesn't brook any uh, any nonsense. So it's like you kind of have to be a, a badass in your own right to be able to to have those interactions with them because he's looking for somebody you can like kind of you know bat it around with as an equal yeah i like the, the the layer of that basically they're there are very depressed people they don't really feel like they have a purpose anymore and that's he's, he's kind of hoping that that you know defending these free cities will kind of like raise their spirits a little bit it's just not what you would expect out of a character like that so it's i'm very interested to find out more about this this race a lot yeah no, they're uh, they're a favorite. Uh, who else? I mean, there's lots here. We talk about the bridge burners here. In this traditional fantasy story, this is your ragtag group that you're going to follow. This is your band of brothers, and you're finding out yep. right away. You're like, well, they are part of this uh, this this empire that's conquering these free cities. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this, you know. And then you really then he gets you attached to this group at the Phoenix Inn yep. and Darujistan, and then you're like. Well, I like all these characters, and they're about to face each other. That's very Song of Ice and Fire. That's very Joe Abercrombie. I love stuff like that where you're rooting for both sides. I love great characters, and there's a lot of series that claim they have great characters just because they make odd decisions, but I was like, yeah. this is true great characters. I like this a lot. Yeah, no, and I think that's why the prologue or whatever is so key because you see there's kind of like that beef there between uh, – whiskey jack and the new empress you know where he's like dude i'm not on on board with all this stuff that you're doing and they see him later and he's busted down so you're like oh maybe they are like the good guys and um but but i think they're kind of like the black company piece that's what i think he dedicated one of the later books to to glenn cook but i love him because they always make fun of me as being the kind of gooey uh moral center type character so i love like the whiskey jacks the fiddlers i love how fiddlers like whatever they're having that secret meeting and it's like swords laying in the puddle or whatever yeah. <laughs> and he's like getting yelled at it's hilarious uh yeah it's it's right away i, I like the bridge burners uh i, I think uh well, well, quick ben and kalam uh i i need like that buddy cop and i think i'm going to get that in dead house gates uh, i think that's what you uh that's what that's what alan kind of let slip a little bit when uh when he was on that call with us but uh i, I said that i, I come to expect that i'm not going to see any of these characters book to book but uh, with the way the book ends for those two, uh, they're getting like their little spinoff adventure with 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 Absalar. So I'm I'm very interested to see where that goes because I liked Sorry. Uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not sorry that I liked Sorry when she was like an evil twisted villain. I was yeah. all for that. I thought that was a very cool layer. So uh, I don't know what the uh, implications of her still being possessed by Rigoli is going to be. I didn't even catch that she was possessed by Rigoli. I was like, wait, wait, she got possessed twice in like two minutes. That's amazing. So yeah. uh, th there's so many unanswered questions that, but I, but again, I don't, I don't feel bad for liking, sorry. <laughs> No, she's a great character. And that's like what's so crazy too, right? Even at the very beginning, it's like you have the hairlock scene, his guts are all ripped out. And you have kind of like the gnarly assassin guy, the like, you know, army commander guy. And then this, you know, crazy wizard. But the scariest one of all is like the 15 year old girl who's like standing off to the side, just staring daggers. So she's an awesome character. Uh, another character I liked was Dujek One Arm. And I liked mm. it because it seems like, they know he isn't happy with what Lassine's been doing. Obviously, they know this, but they feel like he's just so important. You know, they'll just put up with him being disgruntled. Like, because Tatrin's like, you know, hey, we got to get rid of this. And Lauren's like, no, we'll get rid of you before we get rid of him, basically. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that's why it kind of, the, the way that it ended kind of confused me. I was like, well, so did they just decide one day or did they just figure he was going to break off anyway? So they just needed to take care of it. Or is Tatrin kind of acting on his own? Or is that a read and find out? All of the above, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you'll read and find out more about that. But I think, you know, it's like they kind of forced his or they it, it kind of became a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. Mm. Uh, OK, Talan Imas. Uh, I, I don't mm. know if I'm saying that right, but that's how I'm going to be keep saying it. Sounds good. Um, 
I cannot believe I loved Tool as much as I did. Here's here's and, I, and I've learned he's a fan favorite now. I, I've definitely learned that. But at yeah. first I was like, OK, yeah, just a boring skeleton race. This sounds exciting. I mean, obviously he has like the coolest intro in the book, stabbing a dude from like nuts to next. That was just epic. <laughs> but yeah. uh, again, not not grimdark, but OK. Uh, but <laughs> but I, I, I think it was the humor that this character had really surprised me, this dry wit, you know, and he's making like basically dad jokes and, and Lauren's just like, you know, rolling her eyes at him. I, I loved it so much. It, it just you start getting all these things about this backstory with them and the, and the, the Jag Hut, Jag Oot, however people yep. say it. And I'm like, okay, this is just laying out so much information, but not in a way where I feel exhausted. Like, I want to know more. And I think that that's just something that's not easy to do, but uh, yeah, tool right away. I, I, this, this was my favorite character in this book. I love him. Cause he's almost like uh, in a way more human. He's like cracking all these dry jokes right and it's kind of like the logical consequence of like seeing them go through all this like never-ending war and doing all that stuff and he's kind of like gotten to the breaking point now he's like um, making all these over the head kind of kind of jokes and stuff but I love his little thing about um, futility you know and yeah. she's like oh yeah like does, does is this what you know are you guys like all philosophers she's like are all the the eye mask talk you know thinking about futility he's like no not really she's like why not he's all it's futile <laughs> so good yeah i actually highlighted that uh while i was reading it and then i found out that's like uh if you go on goodreads and you look up quotes that's like the most liked quote from the book so yeah i was like okay so, so i wasn't the only one who really enjoyed that but yeah yeah i now obviously i want to see more of that race and and what 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 happened between them and and the jagged um uh, the, the the whole jagged tyrant thing uh that mm. to me I, I i what i said is like i didn't dislike it i just it felt like it came out of nowhere it's like we're not yeah. like talking about anything all of a sudden uh belden's like oh yeah by the way here's this buried treasure that we're going to go un unlock and it was like well that was kind of out of nowhere but but i liked it I, i'm really interested in that race I, I like the little bit of backstory that we got for race um I, I don't imagine it's the last we've seen of this character obviously since it seems like he's either soul shifting or body hopping or something like that but just you got a character that's apparently not even fully powered yet and he's fighting five dragons i mean that's just something <laughs> the power level in this series is just something i've never seen before and that was just an awesome awesome scene and it makes the very famous art because i think i've seen a depiction of that mm -hmm. art race fighting the dragons four or five different variations of it and yeah i can see why it was an incredible scene yeah no and like the the power level is nuts and it is kind of like the a thing that that is it's almost like the history of Darugistan too that's what's cool about the race storyline is that it kind of is the the underpinnings because they always said how like Darugistan's born on a rumor or whatever and the rumor was that like race was buried there ultimately and that's like why all these people created that city is they were there trying to dig up the treasure and find all this you know magical being and and whatnot so uh it you know that's kind of like the 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 background context and that you know this whole um talon imas jagged thing not just race but you know the whole thing is kind of like the background that this like all this current day happenings and so um it's it's cool you'll read and find out a lot more about that it's actually like the aftermath of them scrapping on that bridge when race is doing all five of those things is kind of like where you pick up with the third book so oh, okay all right yeah well. It's All awesome. right. it's, you, it's making me really upset that I got a wait that I spaced this readout the way that I did. <laughs> but, but you know, I got lots of other stuff I, I, I'm reading in between. I think, I think, uh, I think that's the best way to do it. Um, Agreed. Uh, I always say, I always say his name is it AP Canavan? Is that his name? Yeah. The guy who works yeah. under Erickson. AP. Uh, he actually emailed me about it. He said he thinks that that's a great idea because if you just try to just wolf down the series, you're going to miss a lot. So he said digesting it over the course of two years will be perfect, especially when I'm going to talk about it as much as I am. That's going to uh, get lots of info out there. But I, I think I was sticking with this book pretty good until yeah. I got to the finished. And that's when all of a sudden everything just went. I was like, yeah. all right, I don't know what Azath is. I don't know what this magic acorn does. I don't, I'm not, I don't know if, if Anamanda Ray can shift into a dragon or if he can take control of a dragon. It, yeah, the, the final acts of this kind of just go to crazy town, but yeah. in a beautiful way, like I, in a I want to know more way, but I definitely had a lot of things where I was like, I'm not sure yeah. I understand what's going on right now. And I would reread you know, the same paragraph six times, be like, I still don't think I get it. 
I know. Well, a lot of the stuff like that you're set up to like expect doesn't actually end up happening, right? You're like expecting the big face off between mm-hmm. Raced and Animanda Rake, and that's the climax, right? And then like all of a sudden there's trees and the acorn happens and there's like this demon that comes in from another world. Like, who is that guy? You know what I mean? <laughs> and so uh, that that is like him, I think, taking that traditional trope. And I think that's like what he was saying in his original forward or whatever. Is it like expect the unexpected or we're going to take a lot of this regular stuff and dump it on its uh, head? But I think the finest is cool because it's like that was like the way that they imprisoned him was a, they physically put him down in this hole, but then they took his power and like, you know, sequestered it off in this little acorn. And so it was like, that was his ultimate mission, right? It's like, how can I like eat my little acorn to like fully get all my power back or whatever. And so I I can't imagine how powerful this dude is. Then it's just, that's, I have a feeling I might find out, but yeah, I I can't wait to find out. Cause I, like I said, this is him not even at full power. That's, that's, that's going to be something. Yeah. So uh, I hope I do get that inevitable clash between those two because it sounds like it's going to be a battle of the titans. Yeah, he's uh, he's cool, and he's like you know, and then he takes over Crocus's uncle, right? Yeah, and yeah. that was like a big part of it, and uh, and like just even as a regular human, he was like you know totally jacking stuff up at that fet and just like you know crazy fireballs and unreal damage, and it took like almost the whole cabal to take him down, just like even not even. Like you okay, said, I feel like we should power. talk about the uh, the Phoenix inside here. You talked about Crocus there. Yeah, it, it, Crocus basically was Erickson writing himself as a teenager because I, I while I was reading him, I was like, this seems like me as a teenager just having no idea how to talk to women <laughs> at all and 100%. making all the dumbest dumbest choices that you possibly could. But uh, lots of Lord of the Rings vibes, obviously with the coin bearer, the ring bearer kind of thing like that. Again, that's. It, I think that this series has nothing derivative about it. That's what I really appreciated. It mm. felt like its own thing right away. So I, I, I don't mean that I, I really felt like this was a, doing a Lord of the Rings thing. We left that to Robert Jordan. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, very, very much just writing a teenager in the story. I think that that was, a, that, that was something that I feel like where Stephen King writes himself into a lot of his books. I thought like maybe that was Erickson writing like some of the, his dumb things he did as a teenager, maybe. Maybe I thought he was writing me into the books, honestly. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I think he even said he was like frustrated with Crocus by the end and he had to like change him up in, in future books. But he's like kind of the, I, I, he's like the most wheel of time, you know, kind of like young, bad communication skills, like at the root of a lot of the like conflicts and stuff, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, that is, is so frustrating because I think especially that was me, you know what I mean? It's just not knowing how to, uh, it, when just like a couple of moments of honesty could have saved him so much, you know, trouble or got, like got him the girl, right. He's like with sorry. And he kind of like, he's digging on her, but then he's like being super mean to her, but then he doesn't know like, ah, Gross. Yeah, and then when when Chalice, when he realizes that she, dude, she hasn't even like given you a second thought, and you're like obsessing over her, I was like, we've all been there, bro. <laughs> oh know? yeah, oh, so um, bad. Uh, Croup seems to be or Krupp. Uh, how do you say it? Yeah, I said I said Croup for ages, yeah. and then I got so many negative comments. Yeah. Like, it's Krupp. <laughs> I was like, so. people are okay with the pronunciations, but when I said Croup, they just acted like I just I just pissed in their face or something. So. <laughs> Been there, done yeah. that, my friend. Uh, I'll just say Krupp or, or Krupp or however you say it. That's how I'll talk about it. But uh, I think that this seems to be a very divisive character. Like, as oh, yeah. you know, uh, our, our buddy Alan is not a fan of <laughs> in his his fake voice that he did for, for him on our, our call. It will be what I hear when I read it now, uh, unavoidable. But I feel like I was kind of indifferent because – I didn't understand what was going on in some of his, most of his chapters. Uh, yeah. Anything that was a dream. I was like, is this really happening? Wait. So, so Tattersail is like reborn in night chills body or something, but it's like 300,000 years in the past. Is that- yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's where the book really, really started to, to be like, I'm just going to kind of roll with it. I don't even know what a, a bone was a bone hunter. Oh yeah. The bone casters. Bone caster. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like basically the shaman for the eye mass or whatever. Yeah, but Krupp's dreams are weird because it's like they're kind of outside of space and time in a way where it's like you can have all, you know, it's like that guy was like Pran Cole is the bone caster who came into that dream or whatever. But it's like for him, that was like in real time for him too, right? Like that was just like one night he was just chilling 300,000 years ago and then like rolls into Krupp's dream in the same way that it was like that night for Krupp, you know? So it's just a weird... uh, 
thing. And that's kind of like a, I don't know if that's a war in power or what, you know what I mean? That's why it's like so crazy about the magic system is that there's like Krupp's almost like a thing unto him, unto himself. But I like him just because he's super over the top, right? But everyone recognizes that and nobody's like reveres him. All of his homies are like, you know, rolling their eyes and making fun of him too. And they're like giving a break, Krupp and totally trash talking him. So it's like he is over the top, but even people are there like to, to keep it real with <laughs> him. I've, on my Discord, it seems like everybody loves him, but there are a mm. lot. I've seen now it's quite divisive. Of, he's a, a very divisive character. You love or hate him. There's no yeah. middle ground. I'm still undecided. <laughs> all right, I, like, I, all I, right. I stand corrected. I didn't. Uh, I would have never picked him to be the eel. Now, to me, it's glaringly obvious. But yeah, I never would have. I never. He wouldn't have been my tenth guess. Yeah, and I think totally. I was thinking it was Rolic Nam the whole time is what it was going to turn out being. I was like, even though I've been in Ralik Nam's head, I feel like yeah. he's going to try to trick me with that. But yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that part too, where uh, Krupp is like organizing the meeting between the eel and uh, Baruch. And he's like, look, I need to meet your boss. He's like, all right, I'll take a message to him, bro. <laughs> uh, talk about Ralik Nam for a second. I, I, yeah. This is like unexpectedly a uh, top three or three or five character for me in this. Is I, I, at first I was just kind of like, I, I don't know. I don't know about him, but, uh, the action in this is in it, it kind of mixed with the humor is like the action the fight that Ralik Nam has with Ocelot is just awesome oh, yeah. I mean it's just it's just like you cinematically you can see it in your head it's described so well and that's why it confused me but people told me that Erickson like writing characters and writing action isn't his strong point and I'm like well I disagree based off of this book but then the humor side is you're expecting this huge fight between him and Turban Orr. You know, you talk about how Turban Orr is a badass with a sword and, and Ralik Nam's still kind of hurt, you know, is it, and he beats him in two moves. You know? Oh my God. And I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Totally. No, Ralik Nam was a total badass. And then, and like, I love the friendship side of him too. Cause he's like also like ride or die for his homie Cole. That's like what motivated that whole turban or thing and just like not fighting by the rules you know it's like he wasn't there to have a fencing match with this dude he was there to kill him so that was uh you know and he just like are you gonna shut up are you gonna come over here so i can kill you kind of you know what i mean he's like the guy wanted to have this big uh grand you know stage thing and he's like i just want to stab you so let's just get this over with i'm not a showman yeah (laughs) all business uh you mentioned cole uh, that's probably when I realized, hey, there aren't any throwaway characters in this. I thought he was just kind of be a, the, the drunker, the the background kind of character. And he tried, this guy is quite important, and I had no idea. And it was that campfire discussion that him and Ganos Prawn had that I was like, that might be my favorite scene in the whole book. That was the, the interaction between those two right there was so so good. And I'm like, again, you guys are telling me he can't write characters, and I was like this book has what, like 60 characters. And I was like, I wasn't getting none of them confused. I felt like he differentiated them. Well, that's definitely a strong point for me. Yeah, definitely. I love that moment too. Cause it's like, you have these two like battle scarred now, like, you know, soldiers out there, like Gano says fresh wounds or whatever. And Cole's like, you know, been down and out for a long time. And they kind of find that uh, common mm-hmm. bond. And in some ways, like, that's what gives them the the kind of shot in the arm they need after that to kind of get motivated to do stuff again. Cause Ganos is like, my chick just died. Like I just lost talk in some giant rift. I like, you know, went into this crazy sore. <laughs> so uh, no, I love it. And it's also kind of that bridge between, you know, like we were saying before the good guys, the bridge burners who we thought were the good guys. And then like the actual like dudes who are just trying to defend their city. And that's like kind of how they all end up getting together and kind of going against a more um, common, common threat, which ended up being cool so that you could root for both of them still. I guess we should talk about Ganos here for a second. I say, if I feel mm. like if there is a main character in the book, I'd feel like it's kind of him. You know, he starts in the prologue and pretty much is the whole uh, him or Crocus. I think it's like kind of those two would be probably, be yeah. if I had to pick a main character for the book, because I felt like they had the biggest arcs. Uh, I, I actually shouted out loud, Holy Abercrombie in chapter three, I think, when I thought that he had been killed. I was like, that's, that's wild. And that's when we get introduced to, okay, there are gods that are still very much in play in this yeah. universe and we we learn about shadow throne and uh is it carol am i saying carol right oh carol yeah um i'm not sure i understand and i'm sure it'll be explained uh the difference between an ascendant and an elder god and, and which are which uh but uh yeah this i think i learned right away okay death i i there's a quote in here where it says shake your fist all you want but dead is dead and i'm like but is it though <laughs> i mean because i thought Peron was dead here and then now he he's come back uh maybe different uh so but just the whole idea 
of uh, Hood's Gate, like being made out of dead bodies and stuff. So, yeah. so cool. I, I was all about it. I love the hounds. Uh, so I, again, I, I, if I'm supposed to be disliking any of these characters, I'm not, because I like all of this stuff. I think all this stuff is just so huge. But realizing that the gods are still in play right from the beginning is, is very interesting stuff. Yeah, it's not just like a god that somebody is like praying to or that there's like a book written about or something. It's like, no, they're straight up in play, like pulling strings, trying to mastermind chess pieces around the the puzzle. And Ganos is like the big uh, window into into that stuff. I love him as a character, too, just like as a dude. Right. He's so like funny. I love even at the beginning when he like goes to meet the the empress and his like horse comes out of the war and he like totally knocks over the head of the claw and he's like oh sorry dude <laughs> um, you know he's he's a, a really cool character and he goes toe to toe with some like you know like you said shadow throne he go he goes uh or he like talks to rake one-on-one -on -one in a fairly like confrontational um scenario he like has that moment where he gets Oppen to come help him in the sword right and he's like grab the god and he's like shaking yeah. him and he's yeah. like you're gonna help me so um i i love him he's got like this really irreverent sense of humor he's always got this chip on his shoulder because he's like the noble and everybody hates noble so he's always got something to prove but yet he's like refuses to try and uh prove anything <laughs> so uh, he's just a, a great like kind of gritty character i love him yeah, I like what he's a uh, fighting Groot, basically the mm -hmm. tree monster, and he's just like biting it with his teeth. <laughs> yeah, like, and that's like a scrapper, <laughs> totally. And it comes out of nowhere because he like, and that's like where all the like the anti climax of rake and race and all that, and then all of a sudden it's like about the the kind of parallel thing happening where they're fighting Crocus's uncle, and then he gets roped into this weird like you know other realm to like do battle against the Finnest and like the blood that he got from the the hounds made him just this super g'd up like killer that he straight up eats stuff uh, i feel like i should bring up that I, one of the things i said i wanted to know about whiskey jack was you know what he did kind of to get demoted was it basically just because you know you're part of the old guard and we don't trust you i mean obviously they're trying to kill them now so you, you think it's supplement there but there was a line dropped about basically he was uh fighting with dancer during the middle of a during the middle of was it Dancer or Dossum, I, I get those two mixed uh -huh. up because their names are so similar. Yeah, but I, I don't feel like that line was dropped for no reason, that they were fighting, they, they were arguing in the middle of a battle. Yeah, and I think, you know, well, and I think it goes back to the prologue, too, is that there's, like, the whole old guard, like, kind of uh, cleansing process mm -hmm. that they want to do, but then also the the fact that he was, like, really close with the the kind of other um, option for for the throne i guess if it wasn't going to be lacine then it was probably going to be this other dude and so a he was like trash talking her in the prologue like i'm not on board with what you're doing mm -hmm. b he was like uh close to this other um uh, like i guess her rival and so all of that was was kind of the 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 pretense for him being busted down to just a straight up squad sergeant. Yeah. I think it wasn't until like chapter eight or nine. I realized that that was whiskey Jack in the prologue. Cause he just called him the captain, you know? So yeah. uh, I think there was another time where Lauren's actually talking to someone. It's just like the captain. And I'm like, I'm sure he's going to name these people later. And this, that's probably the kind of thing I think that people really enjoy in rereads is knowing who these characters that are unnamed are. Yeah, totally. That part of like not having to figure out is makes it life a lot easier. Uh, I guess we should talk about Lorne because uh, mm. I, I feel like I, 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 if you wanted to say she was a, a main character of the story, I would probably agree. Um, like I said, I, I don't feel like death is maybe final in this, but I was actually stunned that, that, that it seemed like a lot of development to, to, to end this character in book one. But um, uh, very, yeah. very twisted kind of character. Like you can just see like the, the last shreds of her humanity just being, like, being whittled away in this book and that's uh again that's the kind of character work i love i love stuff like that so i don't know what people were telling me that he can't write characters because I, I can differentiate all of them yeah totally and i i love her you don't get like a lot of her internal monologue but you totally get like all those vibes of her internal conflict right where she's like got all these like personal uh beef with tattersail like when they have that dinner and all that stuff right that she like was the reason why her family died and stuff and like kind of one of the reasons why she went into this line of work anyway and is like such a hard ass and stuff and then like you know she's grappling with that that she wants to be like a good soldier and 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 all that and she has like this moment where she totally just like turns it off and goes oh my god you're right i think it's like talk the younger or something goes like hey you're you know you're that the uh, empress's tool or whatever you can't just be on and she's like oh my god you're right and then she like totally turns it off and goes like ice cold and it's like oh damn 
I she's, think something that's uh that's kind of bad for me is is someone who's talked to a lot of fans is, is things like I know that Talk the Younger is a fan favorite, so I don't think he's dead. You know, so there, there, there's things like that. Like I know Tattersail is a fan favorite, so I knew that it wasn't R.I.P. to Tattersail when when her and Belden kind of blew up there in the desert. But uh, things like that, I feel like might necessarily hold me back a little bit. But uh, I I still am okay with it. I want to talk about Tattersail for a second here. Is I think when you do the scene that you just mentioned is I think in a traditional fantasy tale, Tattersell is going to be set up as, as, an, as a protagonist. And then you hear about all this awful stuff that she did. And you're like, okay, yeah. All these characters got some skeletons, I think. Yeah, totally. And to see her like own it too. Like that was actually a really G'd up moment for her yeah, too. She, you know yeah. what I mean? Cause she confronted her and she's like, yep, you're right. She's like, I'll duel you. Like, and she knew straight up that this chick has a sword that's immune to magic or what. So she was basically saying, yeah, it's cool. I'll let you kill me. Uh, so it's like, she's, that's like, makes you like her more, but then like that moment of her making you like her more is her admitting to these atrocities too. So it's kind of weird. Uh, Before I forget, I want to bring up these swords. And we talked about Rake's sword, obviously. That's, that's just awesome. But um, hmm. Chance, and how do you yes. say um, Lauren Sword's name? How's it pronounced? Otaro? Yeah. Otaro. Okay, so Ganos gives up his sword to Shadow Throne, I believe, right? Chance. Is when, and I believe, believe yep. it said that, you know, give it to someone that you, uh, that you don't want or something like that. I forget what exactly it was. But, yep. uh, and then he takes her sword after she passes so it's kind of like with crocus throwing the throwing the coin in the ocean it's like i don't feel like it's that easy you know i, I feel like there's obviously gonna be repercussions for this like first i was like okay is ganos like super powered now because he's heard about how nobody can hurt these hounds and he just comes up and stabs one it's like oh, okay well it seems like he can hurt they can be hurt just fine and i thought okay it was something about this sword so he's got rid of that sword now he's got another magic sword and that's how i'm like swords are going to be very important in this series i'm thinking correct Yes, definitely. And just weapons in general. There's a lot of badass weapons. That's that, that sounded like a big read and find out right there. Okay, great. Okay, well, I feel like I'm on the right track there. But uh, yeah, uh, the, given, this, given the sword to, to uh, Shadow Throne, I'm like, I don't know what's going on there. I, I can't figure Shadow Throne out at all. Why did Quick Ben uh, used to you know serve under him? And now he, yeah. he, he can, like, I guess Quick Ben can like shapeshift so he can like sh- change his identity or something like that. So many powers that I don't know about yet. And I'm just kind of like, I got to know more. But Quick Ben is a character I think got a oh. little bit more development in this than I expected. But it only just, it, it answered one question and it gave me three more, you know? So those Every are books. Time. I like them. Yeah. Yeah. No, Quick Ben's a, an amazing character. He's like this really awesome mage, but then he's like also just like a really smart, uh guy too so even though he can you know g somebody up with magic like no other like a lot of it's just he's outwitting people too which i love and uh the mention of uh, i think he's from seven the seven cities right mm-hmm. okay yep. all right so him and callum i'm trying to figure how this is all broken up here uh this is jenna Bacchus, and i believe mm-hmm. book two is supposed to be seven cities is that accurate yep Okay, and exactly. then book three, we come back to Jenna back. Okay, all right. So I, I feel like that's helped me with the structure a little bit is, is treating these kind of like it's anthology tales, uh, but you can have some crossover between them. And, you know, yeah, I mean, totally. eventually I, I, I think, I hope that it, you know, this is all going to converge together. It does. But I, I think that that's something I appreciate. I know a lot of people criticize that. Uh, I think I appreciate it because if this world is as big as it's supposed to be, I would prefer him breaking it up like that instead of throwing it all at me at once because I never felt overwhelmed with this. If you've read something like A Wheel of Time or Stormlight Archive, I think you'll be okay uh, with the world building in this. But if he tried to throw these apparently three different plot lines, I think that he goes through what the Lotharis, what's the third race? Oh yeah, Lothari. Lothari, yeah. The Lothari and try to throw the Malazan Empire and try to throw seven cities all in there at once. I feel like it would have been too much you know, right yeah. away. So uh, I actually kind of appreciate he's doing it that that, that way so um it makes I think sense. that's the right attitude to have right yeah it, it ends up making sense it's for a purpose you know he goes back and and you're actually exploring stuff that you find out in the first three books and that's kind of these detours they feel like detours but you're you're going back and exploring some of the stuff that you just found out actually and so then once you get to the end of it you're like oh yeah i get it okay because i mean i think if whenever i would read any non-spoiler reviews always the criticism was a new cast again, you know, and people would just be pissed off. I think when they got to, people were like, okay, I feel like I get it now. And then Midnight Titans is like, no, you don't. And it's yeah. like, okay, so we're going to deal with a whole nother group here. So uh, I, I think treating it like an anthology is probably the best way to, to, to move forward with it, even though you do feel like 
hey, I just got like attached to all these characters and now I don't have them anymore. But I think that, you know, not having to wait years between books is something that'll make that a little easier. I'm sure if oh, you're yeah. waiting years between releases of these, which I don't think were really that long. Didn't he write the whole series in like 12 years or release the whole series in 12 years? Yeah, he's a machine, so it wouldn't even have been that bad anyway, but yeah. I mean, I've read the backstory about this, about how he, they pitched it as a movie script and things mm -hmm. like that. And then I think started writing it like in the early 90s and it wasn't published till 99. But I was like, but he wrote and they get they get meatier. Every book gets bigger. And it's like he did this in like a decade. That's amazing. As someone who has been waiting for George for years to write books. I mean, how did this guy do this? So he very clearly had a had a timeline, had a, you know, an outline of the beginning, middle and end. And I think that that's uh, something that serves it well. And I'm so glad I waited until the series was done because, yeah, waiting between these would be rough if I'm going to keep shifting casts and locations. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely written with the end game in mind. I think he even said like he had to do them super quick like that because he doesn't have all these notes and everything. And so to like make sure everything was straight in his mind, he had to like, you know what I mean? Boom, boom, boom. Right, so. Here's a couple of questions for outside of Gardens of the Moon. Um, on a reread, how, do you do this this ultimate reading order with like the the, the Esselmont books or have, have you read all those? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I've read them all, but I've never done the ultimate reading order. Like I've always read, even in my rereads, I've done ten books first, and then I do the the kind of contemporaneous um, mm -hmm. Esselmont books, and then I go back and do the the prequels. And there's like people who are diehard, like you have to. Uh, mix them in and then there's like diehard like publication order people so I, I like that like they have different writing styles so for me I like keeping the tone of the 10 books and that's like what works for me but I think you know there's I I respect both both arguments it just depends on what's more important to you do you want to have like the continuity of like stopping in the middle of some erickson stuff to go and find out definitively on like a side story what happens with that group of characters and then come back in for me, I think it just I it's easier for me to just stick with one author and one writing style because it's called the Book of the Fallen for a reason. I look at the ten books as kind of one big book with ten parts, you know. Yeah, I think for every for every one person, one Malazan veteran that pops up and is like, Oh, you gotta read all the, the ice books at the same time, you have three people being like, Are you trying to scare him away? <laughs> you know, because yeah. that's that definitely I think even Erickson himself said not to do that in your first reading you know, that, that would really, really confuse you. But I, I guess my, my, my whole question is, would you, do you consider those books like the same quality? They don't feel, they don't feel like lesser in quality. No, they are different though. You know, they're just, uh, they're, they're totally different styles, but I love them uh, just as much. Pro well, I wouldn't say love them just as much. I do love the 10 books the most, but I, I love them for being just like fun hits. They're smaller. Um, they're more action packed and just like um, linear kind of plot lines. So, and they're like fleshing out people who I care about from the main books. So I think that's the, the biggest thing I love about them. As far as Erickson, he is still writing on the series, though, right? Some prequel novels and things like that? Yeah, he just did a novella. It's, like, actually a great time because he's got a prequel novel that he's writing now. He's got one that's in edit right now or, like, in publication. I think he just did the final copy edit, and that's for the a sequel. So after the end of the 10 books, it picks up. And then he's got another one that he's uh, writing right now, which is finishing off his prequel series that happens way, way at the beginning and actually explores those tis dandy. So he doesn't plan on stopping this universe anytime soon, huh? No. And I think his buddy Esselmont's going to write even more stuff. Like some of that uh, battle stuff that happens before the stuff we see in gardens of the moon, you know how they were like fighting up North and then we see yeah. him and pale, like they might go back and flesh out that those battles up North that happened before the beginning of gardens of the moon. So it's, uh, it's going to be fun. There's so much cool stuff coming down the pike. I, I, I'm excited. And here's the thing is like, I know I've just barely scraped the surface, but I feel like this is the quickest I've gotten invested in a new fantasy world, probably since Stormlight Archive a, a few years back, just because it just, it feels so fresh and unique and it doesn't feel, it was what I needed, you know, because I read a lot of fantasy and a lot of it I'll be reading yeah. it and I'll be like, yeah, this is kind of like this book. Hey, this is taking inspiration from that book, or this is just flat out copying this book. This feels like the guy just said, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And if it clicks, it clicks. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And I, re and I respect that. And I can't think of yeah. anything similar to, to what I just read. And I think that this is just the highest of compliment coming from me. 
Yeah, no, that is. I'm I'm so pumped that you love it. I've been like so excited to see just like all the positive feedback and the read along and uh, you know the the channel in general and the comments and stuff because it is. It's not for everyone, but uh, it's so much fun. And I think there's so many levels to enjoy it on. You just have like the straight up raw enjoyment of like the lasers and fireballs. It's got like the kind of philosophical stuff. I think it has the characters to get involved with the kind of. Uh, mystery and stuff it's got crazy nebulous magic that you're always being surprised by so it's like you can be you know really intellectual philosophical brainiac and and enjoy them for that reason or you can just be like dude i like seeing people's heads explode and dogs rip stuff uh you know what i mean and like them for that too so it's kind of got uh something for everyone yeah people tell me oh well you be careful because it gets a little more philosophical there towards the end and i'm like frank herbert I'm a big fan of this. If it's done right, if it's not preachy, it, you know, I'm, I'm all yeah. for it. You know, if it, if it gets like to God emperor or Dune levels, man, I'm, I can't wait. I'm going to be very, yeah. very excited. But, uh, and there's still amazing battles in all those books too. So it gets a little more philosophical, but you still get uh, some pretty sick uh, action. Great. And I, I hear the thing right now is everything that I, I hear like, okay, there's a, there's another story there. And I'm like, well, am I going to get that answer in this series? Or is that going to be a prequel novel? And that's why I say, okay, now that I feel like I'm interested enough, I'll consider reading those when I'm done. Right. But at the time I was like, look, I'm going to do the 10 books and that's it. So if it's got that many hooks in me already, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be interested in reading all those and trying to track down matching covers is going to be fun. Oh yeah. I just, uh, I just finished like a two year journey and finally have a full set of hardbacks. And oh a man. I, see, blood, I wish this would get more popular so that they would do a, a, a mass reprinting on hardcover to have them all match. Cause I, I eventually just bought the mass market paperbacks. It's the only ones I could find that match. Yeah. You know, and they're very cool, but you get down another like dust of dreams and cripple God, that, that, that paperback is so big. There's no way you can read it without it breaking in half. There's like yeah. no way. Oh, so. I know. And uh, yeah, finding the hardbacks was a, a recipe for, for disaster for your bank account, your marriage, yeah, and all that I stuff. Bet. So yeah, when I was trying to find all the Wheel of Time ones on hardcover, that cost me a pretty penny on some of those earlier books too, to find a, uh, some first editions or the, you know, the, uh, the, the dust jacket, not torn, things like that. So uh, I, I yeah. can imagine for this, it's even worse. So uh, yeah, the perils of being a book collector, it can, it can really get to you. Yeah, but exactly. uh, guys, please check out his channel. One of the coolest places he does both spoiler and non-spoiler stuff. Now right. that I've read Guardians of the Moon, I can watch all his spoiler videos. I can't wait because uh, I like that you inject a lot of humor into them too. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's something that I try to do on my channel, just kind of be no nonsense, talk about the books. But I love you put like little video clips and stuff in there. Always makes me keep it light. Up. Yeah. And, and I just, like I said, uh, you do the community posts on YouTube and I'm like, wow, I understand some of these references now. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, I'll drop that, uh, that link into the description here. I hope you guys will check it out. Anything else you want to want to plug before we go? No, I'm just, uh, I'm so pumped to, to, you know, see you guys loving the books and that more people are, are discovering them. I think you you hit the nail on the head that the negative hype is, uh, you know, much ado about nothing and that there's a lot to love. So I just uh, appreciate the light you're shining on this series. You're, uh, you're doing the God's work. I, I, I am excited to do it. I'm always, I'm just glad so many people wanted to do it with me. And, and just real fast on that is you're, you read Wheel of Time first before this, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. See, the same thing, I kind of feel like the same thing. Wheel of Time fans chase off a lot of new readers to say, hey, books seven through ten, seven through 10 are terribly boring. And it's like, well, are you trying to chase people away? So yeah, yeah. stop telling people, oh, this is so hard, you're never going to understand it. It's challenging, you got to pay attention, but you yeah. need to pay attention to read epic fantasy. But I will yeah. say, don't start here, guys. If you've never read fantasy before, don't start here. This is definitely for once you uh, once you have the training wheels off, for sure. Yeah, I think so. Well, I appreciate you taking time out on a weekend to speak with me, and uh, I can't wait to uh, be able to dig further into your channel and maybe talk to you uh, again once we get a little further. I'm going to have Philip on for me to talk Deadhouse Gates, and I think AP is going to come on with me to talk Memories of Ice, but uh, awesome. then maybe we can rotate it around or something like that. But uh, I look very much forward to, to talking with you again, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you so much for having me. Of course.